Now, Doss, calm down a little bit, please. <laughs> right, right, I've right. got a very excited co-host here in Doss. <laughs> Paddy Kisnorbo, welcome to the Doss and D Show. Thank you for having me. How are you, mate? It's good to have you back in Australia. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Go on, uh, yeah, I'm good. Just uh, spending some time with the family and, and friends. Yeah, and you've been it. back for two months now. Yep. We're here. And how's it all? How are you going settling back into Melbourne life? Yeah, it's been it's been great, you know, spending some time with the family, spending some time with the kids, um, going to watch my kids play sports. Um, so it's doing the, the daddy things and also being a husband yeah, uh, yeah. to my wife who I haven't seen for, you know, a long time. So it's been a great couple of months. Yeah, you two must, well, you're both very successful in your own rights and your own careers. It's probably hard to find time, I'm sure. It's Now that you're back, how's that all going, finding the balance? Yeah, for me, it's okay. I'm not yeah. working, so <laughs> yeah. um, she's the one that's uh, that's really busy. Um, but look, we, we, we find our, our time together and, you know, when the time that we spend together, it's, we make sure it's quality time. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk, we're going to cover, you know, your whole career today and, and we can't wait to dive into life as a player and as life as a coach as well. But also probably managing relationships with players, but also in your private life, especially traveling around the world. But how did you go in that long distance period? You, you mentioned to us off air that it was a long distance relationship for a while. Look, when I first met my wife, who was my girlfriend back then, we did long distance for three years before she oh, actually really? moved over to England. So it was pretty like normal for us. Yeah. Um, so look, look, it, it's, it gets hard at times, but you know, we've been doing it our whole life. So it was pretty much the norm, you know, and, Again, like I said, when we spend time together, we make sure it's quality time. Um, and obviously when we're not together, we make sure we ring each other as much as we can just to, to see how we, run, how we are together, you know? Yeah. And then you were mentioning uh, just before how good it is actually now have some time being a dad. I think, you know, probably one thing a lot of us as spectators of sport, sport lovers, is you probably don't realise the sacrifice and the commitment that um, professional, not athletes, but managers you yeah, make look, as well. I think behind every like sports person or coach, there's a human. Yeah. Um, and I'm no, I'm no, you know, exception. So I'm, I'm a father as well. So, look, you know, um, it was good to see, you know, my daughter play sport, my soccer and, and basketball and dancing, and just being a dad and spending time and you know having breakfast, you know, because I think we take that for granted mm. um, when you're always with your family and kids, and when you're separated, it's it's difficult because you miss those little things. Um, yeah. So look, I'm fortunate now enough to. To spend some time with them. Are you the dad who can you see yourself coaching your, your daughters in sport, or are you the dad holding the camera? You know, you're videoing them all nah, the time. No. Or I'm, <laughs> I'm the dad that gives advice, but stands on the opposite side of the pitch. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I can't, I can't get involved because in the, the day there's a coach there, yeah. and you know she needs to listen to the coach um, and, and do what the coach wants. Yeah. So going all the way back to really grassroots right. tell us about your love of football when did that begin when did it start when did you kind of see that that would be a pathway for you look i think m my dad was in soccer um so like when he's the coach i used to go to you know all these trainings and you know it was around four or four years old that you know i decided that you know i was going into a club in thomas town and ever since that you know i've just loved the game i love training i love playing and didn't look back really you, you at that age or as you grow up you don't think it's going to be a profession you just do because you love what you do right um it was just as you got older you got better and more people appreciated what you did um and that's how you made a, a living out of it yeah and then you end up at south melbourne which yeah, you know yeah. we're, we're just saying that's currently where we record and it's nice for you to come back and yeah. and see the place but for you like that that's obviously where the great Andrew Poster Cogley was coach yeah. was he the coach when you were there yeah look so I was in the um, South Melbourne youth team at yeah. 14 and then um, Andrew was the coach of the first team and he needed plays as, as young players as he did and I was one of them and you know it was great to see you know how Andrew worked with obviously young kids and and the, and the team it was, it was ruthless um, but that was sort of my first beginnings with Ange. Then he became the under-20 head coach and I was in, in the team. Um, and then obviously Ange progressed and we sort of separated because I was still playing and he was a, a manager. And, you know, once I retired and became a manager, I sort of, you know, bumped, him, bumped into him a few times and, you know, spoke to him. So, look, mm -hmm. it's great to still have that relationship from player to coach. Yeah. Um, but he's also, I consider him a friend and we might not speak every day, um, but, you know, we never you know, uh, you want to call, he's always available to speak to you. Oh, on that note, uh, like you, we see that it's quite a lot of Australian managers and coaches actually overseas and doing really, really well. Yeah. And and basically I'd love to know, is, is there a little WhatsApp group between all, all the coaches that, you know, <laughs> that they might little, you know, nah. do it well or, is, you know, a little catch up here and there. Look, or? I, I think, I think it goes through ages. Like yeah. Angie's a bit older than me. So yeah. I think 
if there was coaches around his age, there would there would be. Yeah. Well, you um, you and Muskie and Harry, you know, you, look, you guys same era. No, yeah, I spoke I speak to him like yeah. I spoke to Harry Walls in Scotland, and yeah. I spoke to Muskie when he was down here. So look, it's not again not every day that we speak, but it's just a little text to say yeah. you know well done and yeah. congratulations on you know you doing well because in the day there's a lot of good coaches in Australia, but we just don't get the recognition. Um, because we're an island so far away from the rest of the world, yeah, you know? yeah. so it's it's difficult. But so you, I think you you must be humble and acknowledge. I think everyone that it's doing well because it's so hard to make it. Mm. When you look back in retrospect over your career and the managers you played under, obviously when you played under Ange, he was obviously a young manager at the time. But right. is it no surprise looking back to see where he's kind of got at the moment? I mean, it's amazing what he's doing at Tottenham. There's constantly rumours swirling about potentially Liverpool. Like right. it's unbelievable. Do you look back and go, I can see that he would have progressed down this route? Look, I, you don't think of that, would he go to Tottenham? But I think it's one thing is very clear. He was clear on his process. He never changed for what he believed in. And that's got him to where you know, he is today. At the end of the day, you, everyone gets an opportunity and he, he got it and he took it. You know, whether it was with the national team, mm. Celtic, um, now obviously Spurs. You know, but he was very clear on what he wanted and the people that he needed to get to where he wanted to get to and the team to succeed. Um, and there's no reason why, you know, he's where he is now. So it's, it's a fantastic effort. But he was very clear back then on, on what he wanted and, and how to do it. Back to, I guess, your earliest memory, when you went over to Europe for the very first time, do you remember uh, – we, we've had a couple of footballers on and one we mentioned his name, Bailey, who we're close with, Bailey Wright. He, I remember him saying he went over when he was 16 and the experience was obviously going into like – some type of share house with a bunch of other boys right. who were all trialling for probably a limited number of spots. I think it was Preston at the time. Yeah. Do you remember in particular a certain moment where you thought, like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Like, this is scary. It's a bit intimidating. It's, you never, yeah. you know. Look, I went on trial for a month to Scotland. So I went to um, Dundee United, Dunfermline, Inverness. Um, Dundee United, I was waiting for an answer back. So I had to wait a week. Um, Inverness wanted to sign me after two days. Dunfermline wanted to sign me, but they had already asked for another centre half to trial, so I had to wait four days. And we thought, you know that, came Hearts. Um, and she within two days I signed. But it wasn't the realisation until I got there, then, you know, they gave me my car, gave me my apartment, said, there you go, I'll see you training on Monday. And it's like, wow, you know, I've never left home. <laughs> I've had always my dinners cooked for yeah. me, my washing done, my mum did everything for me. And then you are left to do everything on your own you know there wasn't google maps then i had to write down where to go that sounds like hell (laughs) (laughs) but it was a realization where like okay now you're in a foreign country you want to play football now you need you know you need to grow up and you know you need to follow your dream and that's what i did what does those initial contracts look like financially back you know your first one do you remember (laughs) (laughs) um you know i I didn't even see it to be honest with you you just Um, just, yeah you know you just believe you're asian and then he's looking after you but at the start you never it's never money even now it's never money of course you you just want to play with the best and be the best um so it was never one of money um but also you know i knew it was a significant um amount to what I was earning at South Melbourne. So I wasn't poor, but I knew I was getting sort of looked after. Um, wasn't Lamborghini money yet? No. <laughs> it wasn't that we got to a Honda. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. got a free Honda. Oh, yeah, lovely. Which I thought I was, I cracked it big time. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was, look, it, it was just one of those things that, you know, with performance and that, you got rewarded. Yeah. And we sort of, I sort of knew that, you know, once I, once I got there. Can you maybe, in that instance, you get over to Hearts, Scotland, England, or obviously Europe, football is the, the number one sport. Did you see a difference in, okay, over here football is different in terms of fans and, and the passion. Over here, obviously, it's it's taken a while to grow the game um, and, and get more eyeballs on the sport and actually grow the, the number one league, which is the A-League. But was there... Was there a certain moment going into a pub or, or that I was getting a ver- verbal abuse from fans? Like, could you could you feel that the sport was different over there? I think there's two parts of that. I think the, the difference with players was one and the environment. Like, when you went in there, you think, wow, like, it's life and death here where you come from Australia and everyone is nice and you're playing just to have fun <laughs> and it's like everyone wants to kill you over there. You know, you think, wow, like, okay, you need a, you need a man up here. And then when you play a game... You might kick the ball out and hear everyone claps and over there he is like, you're getting heckled. You think, wow, like I didn't mean it, but this is what this means a lot to them. So as 
it progressed, you know, you, you knew very quickly the difference between what it meant to Australians and what it meant to, you know, people abroad. And obviously, because there's no relegation here, mm. it, it's a bit easier. I'm not saying it's um, better, but it's a bit easier. Where over there, every game is life and death. And, and they've been supporters of that club for, you know, through generations. It's gone through families, you know. So, you know, go, and go to Hearts, I'll just give you an example of Hearts. Everyone that supported Hearts, their grandfather supported Hearts, their grandfather's grandfather supported Hearts. So it meant everything for them and to them. So knowing that when you perform there and you want to play for them, it meant everything to them. So you had to give everything or else you would know about it. Um, Bailey, who Doss mentioned earlier, ref, like he told us this unbelievable story from his early days in England. And he was trialling, as was a lot of other guys. And one day, a guy with a balaclava in the street came from behind and, and whacked him and basically knocked him out, left him there on the street, ran away. And to this day, he believes that it was other guys he was trialling against because they were up against spots. Wow. Now, did you ever experience that kind of, maybe not to that level, but competitiveness amongst teammates for, for spots and what was that like over especially in Scotland and England yeah I was I was when I was trialing at Hearts it was, it was the second day I think um, and one of the guys broke my nose right and I was like What's, well this is only like a, a practice game sort of thing and the, one of the boys goes listen mate like come on look after yourself and once he like gave me the confidence of that you know I just let off I just let rip and gave him back to him you know mm. but that's the level of competition that you're up against you know that you know, they want your job, you want theirs. You know, I, and again, come from Australia, being so naive, I didn't think of it as a job. I just thought of something that I'm that I do and I love. Where over there, it's life and death, and I learned very quickly that you know it meant so much more. So, look, having my nose broken after the second day, it was a real eye opener. But I knew straight after that, okay, you must look after yourself, and you got to take this pr pretty seriously if you want to be here. Yeah, for sure. No. Oh, but I'm trying to put myself in the shoe. How old were you when you played for Hearts? First? So I think I left when I was 21. Okay, right. yeah. So that's like really, really raw <laughs> still. I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of being a 21-year-old. You, and you're living on your own? I was living on my own. Everything was on my own. You know, as you, when you go over there, you have no friends. Yeah. You know, again, you're the new kid on the block. So, you know, the that was quite difficult in sort of trying to find myself in there. But I think they respect you on the field before off the field. If you show that you can play or, you know, you, you look you look after yourself and you're a good teammate, I think that's when you gain the respect off the field. And and I was lucky enough to meet some really good friends there. Do you, is that still, like, now transitioning into managing and coaching, is that still the case now? Because you see in other codes, in particular, say, Aussie Rules AFL over here, the, the, the module has changed a little bit and it's more about the person away from the game than the sport itself. Do you see that's transitioned as well? Or yeah. is it still very much... Hey, you earn your respect here on the pitch, and then we can go and have a beer. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's different. I think here, like again, we're so nice. Yeah. Like we're, as a, as a race, as a, an Australian people, we're actually quite nice and quite friendly. Where over there, I don't think it's changed that much. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, again, I, I don't think so. Um, I think they make it easier with the the coach, you know, introducing the players and all that. But I still think there's that competition at stake and that that um competition level. We here when I, we had a troll, I made sure the players made him feel comfortable. We made him feel comfortable so he could just, you know, troll as, as free as possible and try and do the best. Mm. Where I think over there, there's so much competition. Um, no one wants their spot taken. So I think that hasn't changed. But as a human race, I think we're just the way we are. We're yeah. honest. We're good people. We want everyone welcome. Um, and, we're, and we're nice. This episode of the Dawson D Show is brought to you by Fleet Plan Hire Solutions. And we hope you're enjoying this one with Patrick Casnobo. Oh, yes. We're loving it. And we always tell you every week, the big projects that Fleet Plan can get done, whether it's bridges, roads. What else? Railways. Railways as well. But I wouldn't be surprised if they could, you know, dig up a nice big new football pitch or soccer pitch uh, for us. Absolutely. We tell you each week about their customer care. It is second to none. So make sure you hit up Chris and the team today for all your earth moving needs. And of course, remember, tell them that Dawson D sent you. We couldn't do the show without them. Head to fbh.com.au. So at what point do the rumours start swelling that at your time at Hearts that potentially there's an option to go to England? And then what is the process then to, to get across? Um, look, I think the Craig Levine, the manager, he, he's the one that spoke to me and said, listen, I'm going to Leicester. I want you to come, but sort of no one knew until I signed the pre-contract. So look, no one, no one really knew about when I was going. Um, it was pretty much done behind closed doors. Okay. Um, it was sort of as you know, time was coming that I, when I was leaving, then people started to find out, and then they knew I was gone. 
yeah. And and then and then playing for Leicester. What about this? Like, obviously, you've gone from the Scottish League to were Leicester in the Championship at that stage? Yes, they were. What, what, what in your eyes? What was the comparison like in terms of playing? Look, I, I think the Championship was harder just due to the fact I think there was more better players. The Scotland, Scotland was great. Like, don't get me wrong, there's good players, but there's bigger teams in the Championship. Quality of players are probably more. Um, even though Celtic and Rangers are massive clubs, yeah. you know, um, but the quality of play was so much higher, um, and there was more quality teams. So in Scotland, maybe there's a couple um, where the championship, like everyone, could beat you on the on the day. So uh, the the difference was a, a little jump, you know, and I wasn't sort of used to it because I used to play midfield in Scotland, even though I was a defender. And when you get to England, it was so much quicker, you mm. know. So it's like wow, like it's another it's another step up. Were you originally a def- uh, a midfielder? N- never. As a kid, I used to play like a defensive midfielder. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was always a, a centre back. Yeah. And Craig Levine never thought I was a centre back because I was too small. Yeah. Right. Um, so he used to put me in the midfield and just kick lumps out of whoever came past, and that was it. You know, give the ball to the better players, and it's simple, right? Um, but in England, you know, it was so much, so much different. And obviously, when he left, the, the new manager came and put me back to centre half, and that's when. You know, I found it, you know, really comfortable. Mm. So at Leicester, what do you remember your debut? Talk us through that day and, and debuting for such uh, a, a huge club. Yeah, I think it was a cup game. I was injured. I just got back from injury, and you know, it was just coming back. I think it was old. Could be. I'm saying I could have been Oldham. I might yeah, be wrong. Yeah. Um, but it was just a, a, a cup game where okay. you know I felt comfortable, played really, played well, got some minutes, um, and then I was obviously available for selection. You know, the, the following week. Um, I actually can't remember my league debut. Yesterday. Okay. I actually can't. Um, but I remember my first goal was against Watford, which was a header. So it was good to, to break that duck. You know, it was, good, it was a good game, hard game. Um, but there's so many games that you, you play over there that you can't remember all of them. Yeah. So hard. With the, with the goals as a centre-back, right, is, is it – it's actually really interesting because obviously you, you come in and off a corner, a set piece or a free kick and – Typically, you know, the centre-backs are taller blokes, so, you know, that's a great opportunity for a header. But in your eyes, do you set a goal at the start of the season to go, I want to score three goals? Or I want to, like, it, yeah. it, it, like, because we don't typically think of centre-backs as goal scorers, but right. you in your head probably do at a certain point into the game. Yeah, I think selfishly, you, you, think, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I want to score 10 yeah. goals, whatever. Um, but for me, my, my aim was not to concede. Yeah. That was my mentality. Yeah. I don't want to concede goals. So... You know, I didn't say, oh, let's, we only want to concede 40. You know, I said, you know, let's try not concede as many as last season. Yeah. You know, that was sort of the goal for me. I hated conceding goals. But, you know, selfishly, I wanted to score, you know, if I could because I knew, you know, it's another dimension to your game. You know, yeah. I think one year less, I scored 10. Wow. It's 10 headers. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was lucky. But <laughs> yeah. Great service. <laughs> uh, <laughs> great service. But, yeah, it was just one of those, I was – just inform and it was just everything that, that came to me I just put it in the back of the net it was yeah. great correct me if I'm wrong but we, we were reading so you you experienced both ends of the spectrum at, at Leicester in terms of getting relegated yes. and also getting promoted sure. so can you talk to us the main differences of being part of a squad and a team in the greater club when there's a relegation fight or and you do suffer relegation yeah. versus a promotion well I, I, we'll start with promotion I think promotion you know that each game you're going to somewhere better yeah, and the, the, there is pressure, but it's a lesser pressure because if you go for a promotion, you sort of know that you're better than a lot of the teams, and your form is better than a lot of the teams, and you know you, you're looking you're looking down, you're not looking up, so you have a bit of a you bit more free, you know, because you know that there could be a greater goal in front of you. Um, with relegation, you're looking at every result because you know if you stuff up, you know you could be going down, and the pressure is is enormous. You know, you, you can't make a mistake. Or you don't want to make a mistake and the pressure is so hard um, and you feel it that you know you, you just don't want to you just don't want to be in that relegation where when you get for a promotion you're loose you're free you want to play mm. you want to beat them because you know if you get to that end goal you're going to be in the best league in the world yeah yeah where if you get if you get relegated you think oh god we, we're going down and what's going to look like are we going to be here our contracts going down so every game, every minute, you're like, Jesus Christ, look, it's <laughs> so hard. It's so hard. Is everybody on edge? Like, if, if, they, if they say they're not, they are. They're yeah. lying. So what's it like 
the week spending a week at a club yeah. when you're in a relegation fight? What's like because I like we played obviously much lower levels in in football, right. but I, like we, we were talking the other day. You know the difference when a team's got confidence and a team's yeah, yeah, yeah. got non confidence, and you're afraid to. There's a different mentality when you're afraid to make a mistake. Yeah, and, of course. And of course, as you know, you make more mistakes when yeah, you're trying yeah. not to. So talk to us about Look, attention. I think, I think the the lead up to the, the game is just trying to make sure that the the small the detail things are right are done properly um because they're probably the ones that they're going to hurt you in the end so look i think there's tension building up to the game you know, everyone's trying to act relaxed and all that sort of stuff but you know in the end that come saturday or sunday when the game is you're going to have to rely on that result where promotion everyone is up and about because they know that where they're going is going to be better than where they are now mm. so it's completely different mindset even though it shouldn't but it's a completely yeah. different mindset and you know we're humans so confidence is a big thing confidence is a massive thing you know especially when you, you look like facing relegation you know everyone's confidence is down everyone's looking for help everyone's looking around for leaders um and, and it's a it's a different feeling and it, is it true like you mentioned say the contracts right it affects yeah. the whole club not just the players too yeah, like yeah. all of a sudden you know you, you Staff are being paid less. Players are being paid less. Yeah. That's that's a real thing, isn't it? That, that, that's that's a fact. So, like when I was at Leicester, we were, we were in the bottom half for a, a long, long time. Um, we, we end up getting out of it with three games to go, and it felt like we got promoted. Yeah, the relief was ridiculous. <laughs> but in the back of our heads, now we could our contract was half by fifty percent. You know, fifty percent. Yeah, fifty percent. My contract was fifty percent. You know, if you get promoted to the Premier League, it was quadruple your wages. Wow. So is this outlined when you first sign with the club? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you negotiate like in yeah. the day, but my contract, my personal contract was, yeah. you know, my, I'd half my money, um, and if we got promoted, wow. yeah, if we got promoted, I'd quadruple my money. Um, so it, it, so I'm interested. I'm interested in that because that if everyone say got their own, you know, pieces in their contract that dictate you know certain wage sure. changes. I'm, I'm, I, if, if I'm playing in that team or if I'm a, you know, a manager of that team, a, a different player is going to be reacting differently based at that time maybe, of year. Maybe. Like yeah. there's, there's a lot of – like, like Leicester now, like they're in the championship, but they're still on premiership wages. Yeah. So there's, there's no fear because they're still getting paid what they are in the premiership. But if you had players that were not on premiership wages, would they play any different or would they look to leave? You know, that's another thing, you know. Players that have got one year left in the contract aren't really worried if they go down because they can go to another club. I was literally going to ask you about that. Do you <laughs> sense that? Do you know <laughs> yeah, that there's, yeah, there's people that just aren't in for that yeah, fight? 100%, yeah. 100%, 100%. You know, they know they're going to leave and they've probably already organised another contract by January because they're a free agent and they don't really care. As long as they get paid where they are now and they go, you know, they don't care. Yeah. So that, that's it's hard to manage seeing it as a coach but as a player. But it's hard to manage because... You know, you need players for that re for that battle, for that fight, especially in those times because they're so difficult. Mm. Oh, oh, no, you go. No, I, I was just going to ask, uh, just because we were talking off air about the championship and how much we, we love it. My, yeah. my team's a championship team, QPR. But I'd love to know. They are battling relegation for a bit there. Still are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I wish, yeah, wish it was the same story as Leicester at the moment. He will go back up. But um, I would love to know, you as a player, when you think back, wh where was the worst away ground to go to? And maybe the best uh, as well. Um, I'd say Plymouth was the worst because so really? far. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was like a five-hour drive. Um, we would get there, and you know the the heaters would be off. There'd be no hot water. They made the um the club rooms all like dark, so you're depressed before you. <laughs> so already you're like Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we actually want to play this game? Yeah. Um, I'd say Plymouth was probably the worst. Um, what What about worst in terms of? supporter yeah or and i'm not saying throw a club and say yeah they're the no, worst supporters no, no, no. yeah um look i think i was at leeds and i think it's probably the, the best club but when you play against them it's so difficult to go into allen road yeah it's so difficult you know they're, they're crazy um they love their club you know um they support their team and when you play against them you know it, it's it's amazing to be part of it's amazing to be part of but it's for the opposition team <coughs> Excuse me, it's so difficult. Mm. It's so difficult. It's, it's nuts. And talking about Leeds, I mean, we're reading like, I mean, I'm sure you knew we'd ask this question, but the, the famous FA Cup game against mm. a man you, can you take us back to that day? Like as much of the lead up as you can, because obviously Leeds is such a proud <coughs> club with such a proud history. 
Um, and they're obviously building that back up at the moment. But to go away to Man U, yeah. for, the, for the fans anyway, that is a big, big deal. Yeah, I think like the, the night before um, in the hotel, we, cause we played away. You know, the gavel was just relaxed and everyone was pretty relaxed, to be honest. There wasn't really um, a lot of tension. Um, notice, I noticed when you play a lot against big teams, the night before there could be a bit of tension, but everyone was quite relaxed. And even in the morning of, you know, we went for our normal walk and everyone was talking, everyone was fine. Um, it didn't, you didn't realise until you sort of walked in for the warm-up when people started abusing you that you know, you're on for a game. But honestly, with that team there, I never felt any danger at mm. all, any we, we were we were so confident. We knew we had a job, even if we lost. We okay, we gave it our best. But I don't know. It was just you know when you know something. It was just something that day that I knew that we weren't going to lose. I just knew, I just knew it. Um, and again, we, we won one nil. Yeah. So it well, well, keeping a clean sheet. Well, you mentioned earlier that that's that's obviously yeah. your goal is to not concede, but against you know. Uh, yeah. A pretty powerful, <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> powerful, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, Prime Wayne Rooney, but, yeah, but you know, you know, you, they're, they're gonna have chances, right? You're just trying to limit them, and how far and where on the pitch they have those sort of chances. That was sort of the goal. You know, can we limit them chances, and can they sort of shoot from outside the box? It makes it easier for us than in the box or close to the goal, you know. And I thought, you know, the whole team as a collective done a, done a great job that day. Was was he pretty hard to defend, Wayne Rooney, playing against him? He is a great player. Like yeah. he, he, for me. You know, I think he's one of the best in the world or was one of the best yeah. in the world. He, he had everything. He had power, pace, great skill, um, could score. Yeah. He, he could do everything, that guy. Now, tell us the truth because yeah. we, don't want, we don't want the fake <laughs> answer. When there's Wayne Rooney and Berbatov, do you go, shit, that's Wayne Rooney? Are you awestruck or are you just so focused? It's just another no, no, you just got to focus. Yeah. Like, I, I think when you see a name, you think, wow. Mm-hmm. But in the day when, that, when you go on the pitch, you've got a job to do. Because in the, the day you don't you don't want to look stupid, right? Yeah. You, you need it. You need to do well. So, you know, I didn't really, didn't really, you know, care who we're playing against. Mm. You know, I just wanted the, the team to do well and myself to do well. In, in that instance, you got you it like it's an FA it's an FA Cup game. Are you all going there together as a team on a team bus, and you're staying there the night before? Yep. What what's what's the bus trip like back after a win like that? You know, it was, it was quite calm. Was it? I, I, honestly, yeah. it yeah. was quite calm. We had pizzas after, and I rang my yeah. friend. Um, in in Melbourne, just to see how he was, it was really calm. It was it was surreal. I, I just think that because there was so much hype about it, I think mentally we were just fatigued. Yeah. So it was just relaxed. We had a pizza and we went home and prepared for the the, the next week. Because in the day, the, the most important was the league for us. The league was yeah. the most important. So we couldn't get carried away with a great result, even though it was a great result. Um, because we had to focus on the league sort of the week after, you know. But you. When you look back on it, you sort of you know, have to enjoy it a little bit. Yeah. You know, you think, well, we should beat Man United, you know. Yeah. So it was a great thing for the city and the club. Uh, as a player, it was sort of let's recover. You done well, put it, you know, yeah, pat on the back. But the next day, you know, you, you need to get ready. Yeah, there's no week. swapping shirts, <laughs> that, or did you swap no, shirts? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a I'm a, lead, I'm a lead person, and you know, you can't really swap yeah. with no, Man, no Man, Man United, no. you know. So yeah, look, um, I, I didn't swap with anyone. Yeah. No. Did you have back then any uh, – we've heard now footballers come out and talk a bit more openly now through podcasting right. and, and, and broader media about actually what goes on in lead-up to games and, and night before. And I've heard some players talk about, you know, their routine even for home game is to be put up in a hotel the night before. Yeah. Was this happening back then? Were you yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, when, with Leeds, if it was an early kickoff, we stayed at a hotel. Even uh, home – even home, yeah, yeah right. at home. Um, if it was away, we obviously we always stayed in the hotel the night before. Um, if we played at home on a three o'clock kickoff, we would drive to the game. Yeah. Now every ma- every manager is different. You know, they could say, "Listen, we everyone want we want everyone in the hotel." So it just our manager wanted us to, you know, to have a nice sleep at home. So we would drive. You know, on a three o'clock kickoff, we would drive to the the ground every away game. We stayed in a hotel. And what was the process in the hotel? Was that for camaraderie? Did you ha- did you have team meetings or team dinners? Or? Yeah, we had everything. Uh, it's basically, you know, I think it's treatment. You know, you get boys having a good sleep because you know everyone's people that have kids. Um, yeah, okay. You know, you can't drive on your own four hours, three hours to a game. You know, so it was just basically that we know we knew everyone was there. You know, you eat properly, you get your treatment, you have a meeting, you prepare for the game as best you can, and then obviously you go together to the match. Yeah. Well, now transitioning into being a manager is a part of it, selfishly, 
you're you're in control even a bit more. Like you know where they are, they're all here. Yes, definitely. You yeah. know that everything's okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a balance. You yeah. know, like you like that, but you also want your players to feel comfortable and you know in their own environment to get a good sleep to prepare for the game. So, you know, with when I was at Melbourne City, you know, every every home game, I should say, sorry, we you know we stayed in our own house. Yeah, and the boys you know just drove there. Um, when obviously away games we had to fly, so we're all together. Hmm. You know, I think in Europe when I was in France, you know, we stayed um, away games in the hotel, and in the morning of our home games we would go to the hotel, have lunch, have a little sleep, and then you know go, go to the game. I'm interested too, and I've always found this, especially when there's language barriers. So, yep. and you coaching in France and probably having players from all different nationalities, all speaking different languages. How how does communication work? Look, I think football's a universal language. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's because there's so many foreigners these days. Look, at, at times it was difficult because you're trying to say a word, um, but you might not say the right word and the meaning might be completely different. <laughs> yeah. um, but we did everything in French and English, you know. Whenever I – where every day I trained, we had video beforehand in French and English. I had staff around me that could speak French um, <laughs> and I had players that could speak English. So I was trying to combine them both. You know, I, I didn't think the barrier was that much of a problem, um, even though sometimes in games you're trying to get a message across that sometimes they can't understand. So you just got I just got my goalkeeper coach to say it in French. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> yeah. But look, we're so universal now that I, I think football. You know, you just adapt to you know whoever your coach is or whatever you know, country you're coaching in, yeah, you know, or playing in. And I'm thinking as a player, though, if you, if you, for example, went to a country that was totally, I know you're fluent in Italian, right? But if you went to, a, I, I don't know, if you went to the Netherlands, for example, or you right. went to a country that you just have no idea about the language, how, how would that go as a player? That must be difficult. Well, well uh, Netherlands, they speak English. Okay. So, but we'll, we'll say that they don't, right? China, yeah. Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 think it's, I, I think it's just learning. You, know, you have to adapt to them, right? So I think out of respect, you try and learn language. And that's what we did okay. in France. We, tried, we had French classes. So we try to do our best. Okay. Like we try to. And I think, you know, if you play abroad, it's the same thing. You try and do it. Um, but over time, you sort of understand. And, you know, you might pick up on a word that, okay, I understand that. And, and you can do it or you let the players... They understand it, do it first, and then you just emulate and copy it. Yeah, okay. You know, so I think there's ways to to, to do and to make it easier. You yeah, know, it's just it's just part of the game now. Yeah, you know, it, it's just what it is what it is. But yeah, you know, maybe going back a few a few years, coming back to Australia to play. Right. What 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 enticed you to come back home and, and play football in the A League? Look, I, I think I just started. A, I just had a, new, a young family, yeah. um, and my wife was sort of decided that we'll come home and. You know, make our child, um, you know, grow up in, in Australia. And Melbourne Heart back then, you know, came available and, you know, I decided to, you know, to join the club. But, you know, I always wanted to sort of come home in some way to give back to the game. Um, and that's and that's why I came back. Whereabouts did you, you and your wife meet? Where? Yeah. Well, she worked at a cafe. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and I went with uh, one of the boys from South Melbourne. And I, uh, he was talking to this girl. I didn't know who she, who she was, and she was talking. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man, these girls are shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, I ended up marrying her. You know, couldn't believe it. So, look, it was just a random thing. Like, didn't know her. Didn't know who she was. Um, Is this before you left for Europe? Like, were you guys yeah, together? Wow, yeah, since literally, you were... yeah, literally. You know, I, we, I saw her at the cafe, and then she invited me to a party uh, about a couple of months after. And we met up, and you know, we started talking on the phone and then and I said, listen, I have to go overseas. I'm going on trial. And I, I think in her head she thought, okay, well, it's finished. And I said, listen, I'm signing here. You know, I rang her up and said, listen, I'm, I'm staying here now. I'm going to be here for a while now. You know, I want you to move over. And it was sort of that, you know, she was still in uni. Yeah. Um, she probably couldn't, she probably couldn't believe it. So I said, listen, I want to make this work. And, and we did. Wow. And, we, and we made it work, you know, and, yeah, we're what twenty something years just going strong still. Amazing, no, it is amazing. How yeah. quickly in a conversation did you flash? Uh, I'm a professional footballer card. <laughs> 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 no, how long did that take? No, you know, I, I wouldn't say it to her because she probably wouldn't care. <laughs> yeah. um, no, no, I, I didn't. I yeah. didn't. You know, I just say I play soccer, and you know, I think she asked her dad if if I was real, and you know, I think the, the dad asked the next door neighbours, and you know, they'd done their research, and I was a real soccer <laughs> player. So, look, the, the great thing about her is she she never judged me on what I did. 
and she didn't really care on what I did. She, you know, she just liked me for the human that I was, um, which I can't believe she did that. <laughs> <laughs> she needs a medal. Um, yeah, but she, she's a great girl, honestly, yeah. to, to put up with me for a long time. Um, she's a great girl. And then how, how was, so obviously you, you come back home, you, you guys decide, all right, we want to, we want to raise our family here in, in Melbourne. Obviously yep. you bought and bred here in Melbourne. You play, I think, was it maybe one or two years before they turned to Melbourne City from heart to city? Might have been no, two years. it was six months. Six months. And then it was quick. Melbourne City came, or yep. the city group came, and then I stayed another two years and yep. then I retired. So when, is there a point within that, you know, a couple of years where you kind of think in your mind, I do want to get into some type of coaching yeah. position. Yeah, I, I knew my whole life I wanted yeah, to coach okay. after um, because I wasn't good at school. So I, I want to stay within the game. Um, so I knew that I wanted to stay in, in that time I was doing my licenses anyway. So I was just preparing life after football. Yeah. Um, and then obviously I retired and got into coaching straight yeah. away. Yeah. yeah. Was there any time during your playing career, like obviously planning to hopefully become a coach one day where you took things that might have happened to you from previous managers and go, I will never ever implement that or yeah I, I think you learn what not to do then what to do yeah. basically like i think i think it's just the way you treat people and yeah, that's what I, th I learned the most you know like i've had a lot of good managers and a lot of bad managers but the, the things that stick out for me good or bad is the way you've been treated um and the way you've been spoken to so look i'm i'm no saint i'm not um i'm hard but i also have a, a personal connection with my players and a lot of the times in england i didn't have a lot of personal relationships with the coach not everyone but and I felt that when I had a personal relationship with the coach it was so much better um, because you you able to relax more you could go on a, a on a deep um, relationship meaning away from football you could speak to them you know the, I think the managers that try to keep their distance from me like I didn't really get close to them so I couldn't relate to them or you know I didn't have that feeling of I really want to play for you where if a coach took time to, to know who I was and you know, spend a bit of time with me, you know, I'd, gi I'd give everything for. So if, if let's say Doss here completes his childhood dream and, and yep. sides in Melbourne City <laughs> yep. while, you're, while you're the manager, right. what position <laughs> do you reckon I'd be? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What do you reckon? Uh, Centre back? Or yeah, do you like it number would, nine? Yeah, number nine. <laughs> I like that, but I wouldn't be able to score, I don't reckon. So. <laughs> but let's say he's your, he's your star recruit. Right. Or maybe not, let's not even say star recruit, just, right. a, just an, an average player. Sure. How do you build those relationships with him or, or the player, like how, what do you do to implement to get him to so play? Like, for so if I'm si if you're signing for me, you know, I'd, I'd make sure I'd, I'd ring you. Yeah. Um. I'll pull you away from the club. Let's have a coffee. You know, I'd, I'd make sure I talk to you sort of every day. Some things you can improve. Some things you're doing well, and just keep the the, the talk. You know, an open relationship where professional and you know away from football. You know, and just ring maybe once a month. Hey, listen, you're doing fantastically well. Keep going. Just to sh and show them that. I watch, I care for him, you know, how's your family? I'm going to come over for a coffee and meet your family. I did that with all my players, Wow. you know. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, I think we had a special bond because they knew I cared. You know, I wanted to make sure my players knew that I care. You know, whatever happens to them, you know, I, I want to help them, you know. I, I care for them as much as, as possible. So, because you spend so much time with them. Mm. You spend so much time with them. So, you need your players on the pitch to give everything they can because if they don't, you know, you, everyone suffers, in, including the coach. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to make sure our, my players knew that no matter what, they could always have me um, whenever they needed. Mm. How, how does it work? We talked about transfers earlier. How does it work as a manager? Are you given oh, – here as an example in Australia, we have the salary cap. Sure. Are you given y yourself a, a budget and, and, you, and you yourself with your team – know what you need who you want or is it more of the football director that's saying hey um we, we know what we want you guys go and recruit them no i was the other way okay i knew what we wanted um and i said listen can you find this type of player and there could be six in that and then you just process of elimination which one's the best one which one's the most affordable which one we can't afford so we, we do all that research in that and then we end up finding the, the players we want but with me it was clear what i wanted doesn't matter what position and what type of player we wanted. Um, and what due diligence do you guys go into when recruiting a player? Look, so first we find out how the player is in terms of a human. Is he a good person? That's number one because I think that's really important. So we found out if he was really good, if he was coachable. So we'll do our research on that. So is that through 
players that have either played with them or coaches that coach them? Correct. Yeah, okay. You know, or if I didn't know either, you know, you, you, hopefully the football director knows the agent or someone gotcha. of that has got a relationship with them. Um, then we would then we look at like sort of data. We would, we would get their data and say, okay, well, do they work hard? If it's yes, that's a two ticks. And then we would sort of have a look at, okay, can we afford them or can't we? And the ones that we could afford, we would sort of put our eggs that way. And the ones that we couldn't afford, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't sign. And how long is this process from that start to getting them signed? Oh, probably six months, yeah. maybe okay. even longer. Wow. Yeah, maybe even longer. You know, it, it depends, you know, um, so like for, for Lecky, Maliki, I think it was close to seven months. Really? Yeah, like wow. I, we, I spoke to him when he was in Germany. Um, just to show, tell him that, listen, you know, I want to do this, I want to do that. I think we can do this with you. And it was obviously back and forth in terms of negotiation, but I always want to keep that relationship with him. And, you know, I think it was a seven month process in the end. And then obviously he ended up signing. Do you ever have like deadline day signings and, and a typical deadline day signing in your experience? Is it literally sometimes last minute, you're not even considering a player that become available I, when you I think that happens more in Europe yeah. yeah you know like I think in Europe because it's so frantic and there's so many so much play movement um it, it, is, it is a bit like that we're here I don't think it's like that because there's a salary cap so you can't really bring and sell anyone sure. you can you know yeah. so but in Europe definitely definitely be like you know let's get on the phone quickly can we get this person you know and all that sort of stuff what what, what is it like having to I mean I don't know you haven't experienced the other side but in your preference, would you like to not have the salary cap or is the salary cap something you see something as it's, it's crucial in, in the game at the Look, moment here? In my personal opinion, I don't think we should have a salary cap. Yeah. Um, and there's a few reasons why. Look, you know, people say, oh, it will be unfair because certain clubs will, you know, spend more. But you want exposure to the game. So if one team doesn't want to spend money and they're happy with that, that's, that's fine. You know, if they're happy with... 4,000 people or, you know, 100 people, that's fine. But you shouldn't stop the clubs that might be get 30,000 people and can entice uh, a, a big player. You know, mm. I, I think the game needs to grow like that. We're, we're stuck at the moment, I think, now. Like, you know, we're, I think it's two point something million. Um, you can't bring in anyone significant. You know, everyone is sort of the same. You know, and I think it's hard where if I'm a club, you know, and I want to, if I want to spend 30 million, let me spend 30 million. You know, and, and it's my problem if I lose the money, I've got to pay the debt, not you. But we want the game to grow. Hence why, you know, the MLS has just taken off. Yeah. The salary cap, I think New York spent, I think it's 20 million euro. You know, and in 2006, the MLS took the model off the A-League. You know. The marquee but, player? Or? Well, I think the model of, you know, the way the way teams are started, the way they're bought. So yeah. we were bought for 12 million, a club yeah. bought, whatever it was, right? So the MLS started that. Yeah, you know, 2024, they're half a billion, we're still yeah. 12 million. Yeah. So there's no progression. And I know the you know, the market's different. I know the country size is different. I, I, I get all that. But we haven't progressed where the MLS have. And I'm not saying we can attract everyone. No, I'm not. But I think with no salary cap, I think we could attract more players. I think the proof as well is, oh, we're going back. We're winding the clock back here. But a good example is that whole Del Piero right. experiment. Yeah. You know, he, he was probably nearly, probably the biggest import that has, has ever yeah. been brought out to Australia. And in my mind, that was like peak, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the A-League was really pumping at that right. stage. Um, and then obviously you've got, you know, City bringing in Via for those four games and obviously you've got imports that you don't necessarily know of, but yeah. they come across like Borussia or whoever yeah. or, or Tommy Broich. But that it, it clearly works like it gets bums on seats it, it, it does and, and the product is good because yeah. you want to see the best players right i'm not saying you're going to get good players all the time but you want to see the best players play your code you know and, and if we can do that why do we you know self-sabotage and we don't do it and again i know we need a, a lot of things to happen don't get me wrong but you know I, I think it's time that you know we drop the salary cap and let the clubs spend the money and if they lose it they lose it. That's that's their problem, you know. And you know, obviously, there needs to be sort of reinforcement. So, okay, do you have the funds? And I, I get all that sort of stuff. But you know, we need to get this game growing. We need to get this game bigger. The only way Australians will come generally is to see a name. So let's let's give the public what they want and, and do that, and then build off, you know, build off that. You know. Mm. So 
playing devil's advocate though, so I look at leagues like the French league or the right. German league mm-hmm. and, and spent all, all the pretty much all the European leagues where the same teams dominate and, and there's a big gap between the best and the worst. Could that be a potential issue here in Australia if you had two or three clubs right up the top all the time and then the ones down the bottom just can't compete for financial reasons? Is that a problem in your eyes or uh, not? No, not because in the day, like, it hasn't changed. So yep. Bayern Munich always pretty much win, Inter always win, hasn't changed. Yeah. You know, th- they're successful. So when, pe- when people go, oh, like you said, mm-hmm. but that's what they do for success because if they don't come first, then it's – then someone something happens, right? Sure, but that's the price of success. Mm. You know, you need to. I think you need to spend big to get big. But if you spend big and you don't and you lose, well, that's that's part of the game. Mm. You know, Manchester have got the best players, I, I think, in in the league. But they spend big. But Pep's done a fantastic job. But they've won whatever eight trophies. Yeah, but because they've invested, and th- I think the investment is so so important. You know, if you don't invest. You know, you, and you're, like you say, you're always at the bottom, but that's that's hard because how can you keep doing that? Yeah. Then you say, oh, well, I want success. Well, you want success, you need to spend, but you need to bring the players in. So if you can't attract the players, how are you ever going to grow? Mm. How are you ever? And there's w- once in a million where a team from the bottom goes to the top, but the next year they go down. Yeah. You know, so they can't sustain it. Where I'm saying, well, if you can, why don't you keep it like that to get success? Because I think... You know, the, the A-League is great, but I think we need to do better in Asia. Mm-hmm. Now, the Asian Champions League is the next sort of, you know, the the, the European stage for us. You know, but we need to compete in that, you know. Too many teams in Japan, in Korea, Malaysia, mm-hmm. Thailand, you know, they're, they're so advanced than us, you know. And then we're still, we worry about the A-League. Well, mm-hmm. we need to worry about both, in my opinion, because, you know, I think that's the next step, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, global exposure. You know, and that's, that, that's the stage where we, we, we don't get that often, that exposure. We don't, we don't. And then you wonder why, oh, we don't, our national teams are what they are. But because other countries invest the money, well, I'm saying, why don't the A-League invest in the competition? Why don't we invest in our clubs? Why don't we look to compete well in Asia? You know, but, you know, if, you say, Yokohama are spending, you know, 10 million or 20 million and Melbourne City are spending two, you can't really compete. Sure, it's, yeah. it's an off game. Yeah. And then you wonder why you can't progress. Well, it's going to happen every single time. And then you're like you're getting knocked out all the time. It's like, well, what, what's the point of it? Yeah. What, what's the point and, of it? And then, so the at the moment, there's clearly going to be, well, there's, there's obviously, I think that there's a deal in place where I can't remember what year it is, but they are talking about relegation or, or having a second yeah. league. Is that, so, uh, so people yeah. think that's going to change it. I, I, but I don't think it's viable. Yeah. I, I, I think that's going to be an absolute killer for the game because and it's no disrespect to the other clubs but you know i think clubs don't realize how much it costs to actually run a a a club in the a-league you know first you've got your license then you have facilities then you've got players then you've got players wages you know if if i'm with a a team that gets promoted we're pretty much going to go down because we can't attract and then once you go down what happens with your contracts do they go down do you half can they afford to pay you got to hide the ground there's so many things yeah. that go into that where I, th- I think it's just best if we're going to have a team, just put them up. Let's yeah, okay. Buy them, get them in, in, the, in the franchise. Don't have relegation promotion because our game's not big enough. Mm. Yeah, if you're going to put them up, no problem, but make sure they have the finance to back that and, and that's it. If you want to have that second league, have the second league. But I don't think the, the, the teams in, in the like the NPL system understand you know, how much it costs. You know, I think Amy just to – to rent Amy is one hundred and forty thousand per game. Per game, wow! So wow. you're telling me a local club is going to spend one hundred and forty thousand? <laughs> yeah, on a game at Amy. If not, they've got their own facility. But if they have their own facility, they're going to have their own certain parameters in terms yeah. of um, whatever stadium. Yeah, they've got this, to tick everything off. All the boxes. Yeah, that's going to cost over whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's so true. It's a it's a it's a lot of money. Um, and are they prepared? Because if, if they say yes, and what happens if they back out the next year, then the club just fold, you know, and they're going to pay 2.8 million or 2.3 million as a salary cap. Have they got that money? Yeah. But what players can they attract? Because if I'm a A-League player, I'm not going to go down to a team that is going to potentially get promoted. And that's no disres- disrespect to anybody, but because, you know, the next year they might get relegated and you're like, 
but do I lose my money? Does my money go half? Can you afford me to stay? Like, yeah, mm. of course. And, and it's so different. It's well, so difficult. Like we were talking, like, uh, like we were, we remember when the A League was pumping, like it was proper pumping, like the stadiums were uh, full. Yeah, it was must watch TV. Um, sure. And now it, it it seems it's just strange to see it sort of almost go backwards over time. But in your opinion, even at grassroots level. Apparently, soccer is one of the most expensive sports to play. Yeah. Um, what can the A League do, or Football Australia do? Or like, what what can what as a country we could do to to bring this, you know, from grassroots all the way to the A League to to make the standard better or yeah. improve it or fan experience? I don't know. Look, do you see yeah, anything? I, else? I think it's hard. I think we. I think as a country, we, we've always never had a lot of money with investment in football, and that's maybe the soccer result. So I think look. The whole game needs one big person that's got a lot of money, like the AFL. Yeah, they have someone that controls the whole thing. Next, you need like um, a, again, like a let's, let's talk about a base. We haven't even got a base yet, so how can our national teams do anything well? We haven't got a base, so we need to start from I think the top. Once you get the top organised, then it filters down through the through the the bottom. You know, if we're if we're the the number one or not number one, but our grassroots are so high in attendance numbers. How come we're not progressing? Because why they, we're not a poor man's sport anymore. We pay, it's two and a half thousand, you know, in the NPL system for a kid to play. Wow. So little Johnny that might not have that, maybe not can't afford it. So we've gone from, I think it was $150 in my day, which my mum struggled, to two and a half thousand. Wow. Now where's that money going? That is crazy to think. Yeah, well, when you, when you, when you think about it, like you mentioned, the... Uh, the, the boxes that need to be ticked for from a professional yeah. team. There's some basic boxes that probably need to be sure, ticked. Sure. But you're talking maybe the you know the ground being kept. Yeah. Club rooms. Yes. Maybe water. Yeah. yeah. Um, lights. Yes. But other than that, what else needs to be? Probably a stand. Stand. A stand. And maybe the wages of whoever's the the, the football operations or the director of the league. Yeah. I don't know if someone's working that full time. But other than that, if you get, I don't know how many players would be on a squad in each team. Or is that the main difference? Because I think of like AFL clubs and yeah. subs, or when I say AFL, I mean the sport, like foot, Aussie rules footy clubs locally, the subs would be less to play, but you're getting a lot more people on that list. Is that? No, I think it's the same. Oh, really? Yeah, I think I think it's, I think the subs, I think you've got a contract, so the subs still get paid whatever who plays. Okay. If that's what you're talking about. Well, what I was saying is like f to play footy yeah. at, at a grassroots yeah. level locally, like you, you pay your subs or whatever, but you you probably got, whether it's kids or adults, you might have, you could have 70 to 80 people. Right. Because there's three t three teams, there's more players on playing. Right. Versus a, a soccer club that may have, I don't know how many is in the squad, 30, I don't know, versus 70 in the yeah, squad. I, in a different I, think squad. I don't know. I think there's 20 something probably in a, in a first team squad. But yeah, you, but you got the juniors paying their wages basically. I think. Yeah. Okay. You know, and it's like I, I know a story that one player refused to go to the A League because he earned more in his job and in NPL level than playing in the A League. Wow. Really? Like, you know, like it, it's crazy. It, it, it's crazy. And how can that happen? Like, there's a lot of money going in the NPL system, and you wonder why. So I think it's not. We're not aligned. We're not aligned. We're not together, and I think we should be working way more together yeah. to get this game to where it should be. If it's the biggest sport in the world, the most global sport in the world, how come it doesn't work in Australia? Yeah, and we know there's other sports, AFL and cricket, and, but we we get all that. Yeah. But there's also a market for soccer. Absolutely, yeah. and yeah. obviously there's the, at the moment, which is great. There's the, you know the addition of Auckland, who who, yeah. who are now coming into the league. I think it's next season. Yes, there's discussions about. You know, maybe Canberra as sure. well. Yep. Um, I don't know if you've had a phone call there. <laughs> so there's a bit of interest in that. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, uh, do, do, do you think you might ever come back as a head coach somewhere? I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. Time, time will tell. You yeah. know, at the moment, I'm enjoying doing this and yeah. <laughs> spending some time at home. Yeah, yeah. no, that's a, that, that's, a, that's a good, clean media, uh, media <laughs> trained question, Patrick. <laughs> well done, well played. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe well, like, we haven't even touched on it and we're running out of time. No, but, it, it, don't um, about the time. But... You, you were really, really successful at your time at City as head coach. Sure. Um, you obviously, the multiple premiers plates and championships with yeah. the with the girls. Um, and then, you know, you, you spent, was it, was it one or two seasons as an assistant 
under Eric? Or was it one season? Uh, Eric Mombert? Yeah, it was two seasons under Warren Joyce. Warren, Warren Joyce. Uh, and one the, season under Eric. One season under Eric. Sure. Actually, Warren Joyce, that's an interesting one. What was he like working uh, under him? Uh, honestly, he was fantastic. Yeah. You know, to this day, he's sort of he's the one that started the, the behaviour of our team, meaning in working hard and working ethic. Mm. He's the one that started that. He was he was fantastic. Yeah. Great guy. A lot of um a lot of experience working with big, big players. Yeah. Um but he's the one that started sort of like the behaviour in, in you gotta work hard and play. That's that. and then obviously Eric bought the football side yeah. in terms of the the game model and the game style. But Warren bought the behaviour of working hard. Because Warren obviously amongst, you know, the I, I know at the time the city community brought he, he got a bad rap because sure. You know, at, the, at that stage, when we talk about marquee players, like Timmy Cahill was playing for the club at the yeah, time, yeah, yeah. Um, who I'm sure you have a great relationship yeah. with. Obviously, Bruno Fornaroli, who yeah. you know really well. You know, these are probably two of the bigger name players. Sure. Um, almost from an outsider's point of view, it was said that almost they went up to standard or they weren't meeting protocols and they left the club. Like, yeah. do, do, uh, how do you see that situation? So, look, I wasn't around. I was still with the, the girls then. Yeah. So, I only came in when they had gone. Gotcha. So whatever happened before that, you missed it. I, I missed. I, yeah. I, I missed everything. You know, so I didn't really know too much. Yeah, yeah. You were obviously highly successful in your time at Melbourne City. How now, looking back from from the outside, so to right. speak, how do you feel watching them? These like, do you do you pay much attention? Do yeah. you stay away from it? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. You know, yeah. like you know, I'm still a still a fan, and I still try to try to watch them. I don't. I haven't seen too much of them, but I tried to watch them. Yeah. Um, but I've just got great memories, you know. And I still speak to the players. The players still ring me to see how I am. Um, the staff, you know. So I've still got some really good friends and, and good relationship with the club. Um, obviously, I just don't have the time to watch them as much. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but here and there, I still, you know, I still keep my eye on them. Is it a place you'd one day, not saying shortly, but like one day in the future, you'd like to get back yeah. to at some stage, um, even if you went off... Spent time in Europe and then came back towards the end. Which, yeah. Is it a place? I, I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. Like, again, I, I think it's sometimes hard to emulate what you've already done. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when you go back, they think you're going to emulate exactly what you did yeah. beforehand. So, look, I, I don't know. Um, but look, Mel Melbourne City, I had, a, I had a really fantastic time. You know, I, I didn't realise at the time. Um, but when you step away, um, we had some great people, some great players, we played some great football. And, you know, we were successful. Yeah. Uh, being overseas sure. as a coach, obviously at Troy's, you 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 might not look or you might see little bits in the paper, but yeah. did you see what happened? And I'm keen to get your thoughts. As someone who was overseas and you're, you're almost – you're almost an ambassador for the country of yeah, Australia yeah. over yeah. there, you know, yeah. essentially promoting the, our game. Sure. And then you look on TV and you see what happened in the Melbourne Derby. I think it was a couple of years ago yeah. where that – the victory fans stormed the pitch yes, and there yes. was a bucket thrown at yes. Thomas Glover. And um, Did you have people within your camp come up to you going, is this what Australian football is like? No, we were, we were actually on the, on the bus going to a practice game and I was watching it on, on, the, um, on the phone and this was happening, this was unfolding and I was showing some of the French stuff and they couldn't believe it. But it didn't really get recognised back in France. Okay. Um, yeah. But I was showing them like, oh my God, you, you Aussies are crazy. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> Never seen this before, <laughs> no. honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but it didn't get too much attention back yeah. home. Um, but when I was there, I, I was so shocked yeah. that this happened. Like it was shocking. Yeah. Like, wow. Like I couldn't believe this yeah. had gone this at this uh, this far. Did yeah. you ever have any experience of, of crazy fans when you were playing? Of I'm not of either I'm not saying necessarily abuse, but throwing things or oh, we, storming. We got, yeah, we got we got things thrown at us in France a few times. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Just for the fact that, look, we were the youngest team in, in, in Europe or the third youngest team in Europe. We mm. had a, such a young team. I think my captain was 20, 21. What? Yeah. Wow. I, oh, yeah. So people don't realise. Our, our, my captain was – so my lineup was – my keeper was 20. My left centre-back was 21. My right centre-back was 20. My right back was uh, 21. My left back was 25. My centre midfielder was 18. My two number eights – were 23 and 30. My number nine was 19. My num my winger was 19. My right winger and my left winger was 22. Wow. That's ridiculous. 
that, yeah. that's how young that's how young we were yeah. and a lot of them came from new team mm. so we were very young and I, I just I just don't think they understood um, how young we were and again they make mistakes and yeah. it, it's it's it happens yeah you know but that like I said at that level they don't under, they don't really care and they want results cutthroat yeah so you know we're going through you know we, we had a lot of draws you know we should have we should have won a lot a lot more games but we didn't that's, that's what it works you know, and there was a few times, you know, the bus got pelted and stuff like that. I think the main, the main ultra, you know, was like pointing to me and, you know. Only wow. If, only if I could meet him again. Wow. One on one. It'd be, it'd be nice. You know, but they, they didn't, with this young team, you need know, support. You know, when they see that, you know, you talk about stress and how hard it is. Imagine how they're feeling going to every game thinking, you know, we, we had their fa our fans, you know, sort of boo a couple of our players. They're young, but they were so good. They were yeah. so good. And in any other team, they would dominate. They, they wouldn't even play, but they're playing with that. They were playing at Troyes. So we gave them an opportunity and they were doing really well, doing fantastically well, you know. But imagine what they felt, you know, having their own fans build them, which, you know, isn't nice for anyone. Mm. Mm. What, what, what happens, you know, when, when they decide to part ways with you? Yeah. How, how does, would you have any sharing the process or how it all works? Look, was basically, basically, Do they call you or yeah, meet I'll, up? Or? Well, I got a phone call from a certain person who I really respect and yeah, we, we were just speaking and he just said, listen, I think it's, I don't want to do this, but I think, you know, we're going to have to do this. I said, look, I understand there's, there's no, no worries and no love loss and, you know, I respect your decision. And it, to be fair, everyone in the CFG group was, was really good. Um, even though it was a bad time, it, they were really good. And um, the president of Twa, um, who's Dutch, whose name Matisse, he was really he was really good. You know, it was the other staff that really didn't care, and they probably wanted us gone anyway. Yeah, mm. right. it's uh, it's fascinating, and yeah. I mean, it's interesting hearing today just chatting with you the ups and the downs and all the. It, it, it's it's hard. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I think as a manager, you got to realize that one day you might get sacked. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I think I don't forget Mourinho's quote. He goes, "You're not a real manager until you get sacked." <laughs> that that quote has stuck out with you since day one. Yeah, I don't know why, but it always has. You're not a real manager until you get sacked. And here I am. Who's now. the first person you ring after that phone call? Was it your wife? <laughs> yeah, I actually did. I rang my yeah. wife, and I just said, "Look, this is what's happened." And she said, "Listen, don't worry, you've done great." Yeah. Um, you know, just get on a plane and you know, and come home. Well, we've got to get into golf box shortly, but uh, I've got a couple more questions before we finish. But no I'd problem. like to know about your ambition now, you know, for the rest of your football career. What, what you know, dreaming big, what, what yeah. would you love to Look, do? I'd love to coach in the biggest leagues in the world like everyone else and, and be the, the best, you know, version of myself and the best person and the best coach, you know. For me, I think the greatest achievement is um, knowing that you've helped someone achieve their goal. You know, there's all these trophies, and you want to you want to win trophies. Don't get me wrong, but if I can sit here and say, yeah, I helped him, and look where he is now, I think that's a big achievement as a person than anything else. Because you know, um, you're helping another another human's life um, excel. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. look, we've our Monday night indoor soccer team. We've got a head coach opening. <laughs> uh, and you know what? We just love it. You know, I think we've got a centre back opening too. <laughs> <do you? laughs> <laughs> Playing coach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One more before we get to the golf box. Do you? Because I, I love obviously QPR and yeah. I love Neil Warnock, my favourite. I know you played under him. Do you have any? Do you have a Neil Warnock story <laughs> uh, or any? Anything? I don't know if I can say on camera. Yeah, look, we we didn't get we didn't see eye to eye. I mean, oh really? Nah, we di we didn't. And um, yeah, I, I think it's just his his ways were a bit different. You yeah, know? yeah. But I remember him. Um, one day we we came to training and and it was raining. I'm like, oh. We're checking out phone, like, where's the gaffer? And you know where he was, and so we 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 were focusing on on playing and training, whatever. And then he, he comes out with an umbrella, and we worked on throw-ins for about half an hour. <laughs> thinking, <laughs> Jesus Christ, this guy's done eight promotions, and we're working on this. Wow. Like, I, I, honestly, like, some people love him. Yeah. I mean, some people have a real great relationship, and you know, and, that, and that's great because. Yeah, you know, I think he was, he was one of those managers, if you won, we give you three days off. Mm. Yeah. Um, where I didn't want that. You know, if we won, I wanted to keep improving. So again, everyone has their style, but you can't knock it because he's been successful. You know, mm. I remember one time with Al Jew from the international break, he gave him like 10 days. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, are you serious? Yeah. And Jufi didn't come home for about 20 days after. <laughs> and you're like, mate, you're playing with fire here. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. But that's how he was. 
you know, and, you know, again, some people liked it, some people didn't, but it's successful. Yeah. So we get into golf Let's fox? Let's do golf fox, mate. You want to get the... Uh, oh, I don't know. Should I try to do it off the cuff Yeah, again? Yeah, well, <laughs> so Paddy, golf fox, they've been on board with us for a, a few months now. We'll chuck that. Do you want to uh, have a crack at it off the cuff? No, no, <laughs> you, you, you definitely... So not yet, but not yet, not yet. All right. Oh, yeah. Um, basically... Um, you explain we, the game. Explain well, the, the game. Well, the game is, essentially, we... You're going to put your hand in. You're going to yep. mix up. I think we've got about 10 or so in there. Pick out one of the – there could be games, questions, a little sure. challenge. Sure. There's a couple of shockers in there. So right. uh, you trust me, you'll be hoping you're not <laughs> pulling those out. Um, but go on, off the cuff, can you, can you oh, do no. it? Can, come All on, right. you can. We're going to give this a go. What's in the golf box is brought to you by our good friends at Golf Box, Australia's greatest golf superstore. If you need it, they have it, and it gets to you fast and free. Shop online now at golfbox.com.au. You've done well. You've done yes, well. we've done it a few times, Paddy, so now it's <laughs> done to get memorised. Put your hand in there, mate, and let's see how you go. Mix it up. What do you reckon he's going to get? Oh, I don't know. All right. Oh, Doss is going to read this out. Okay. Is he going to have to sing? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not going to have to sing, so he's, he's thinking he's lucky stars. What's one moment you know you stuffed up in your career? could be playing. Yeah. I, I think we had um, – so this was against Doncaster. And, oh, so um, we're back in the – like real early days? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, I'm playing at Leeds and uh, I, I, I'd hurt myself. I hurt my knee and um, there was a scuffle. So we've – We've come in after the game. I think we've won either three, two, or drawn, right? And there's it's all on. It's all in in the in the in the players race. Like there's punches being thrown after it, the game. Yeah. So I remember oh, wow. the dinosaur Andy Lonigan has Chimbonda and he's pulling his hair and smacking him, and it, it's it's on for young and old. Darren wow. O'Day was swinging, and I'm like, shit, this is getting close. So. I've ran to the, the boot room and I've picked up a shovel. <laughs> and you know those miniature shovels where you... The like a spade. Yeah, yeah. Those, and I just started swinging um, to see if I hit anyone. And after that, I think, shit, like... <laughs> oh, my God. Maybe, maybe should have done that because police got involved um, and there was footage and you think, mate, if I've collected someone and I've hurt someone, you know, yeah. I'll be... In big, big trouble here. Was that That's incredible? Was that was yeah. that a one-off, or did, was there was there a lot of words thrown after in the tunnel? In look, I think in that, in my case, I think it was a one-off. Yeah. But there was a, there's a lot of moments that that happen that probably get not, not seen and stuff yeah. like that. But a lot of training moments. I think it's a lot within your team that because you're so competitive and you're so hot tempered and you're so emotional. Yeah. Stuff like that happens. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of scraps that you know training things happen that. Yeah, people don't really know. Well, I, I was listening to on po the podcast you did recently, yeah. and was it true? Like a teammate pulled out a knife or something? No, he, he went to run to the kitchen for the knife. Wow. You know, I remember training at Leicester, and this little guy, Joe, his, name, his name was Joe Mogunda. And we talk about, like, when you first move overseas. Remember we were talking about before, yeah. and, you know, you want to how, – how'd you find it? And you want to stick up for yourself. And this Joe Mogunda used to always call me out. And he was younger than me. He's like, come on, you can we skip? And I'm like, come on, skip. I'm going to smack you one day. I'm going to fight you. I'm thinking, hell, <laughs> like, this guy's serious. And one day I must have woken up wrong and um, he's called me out in front of the boys. And I'm like, you can't back down now. Not today, yeah. So we've gone in the gym and we said, listen, all right, there's no kicks, no no elbows, <gasps> got the gloves and, and we'll, we'll go for two minutes. And I've literally like broken his jaw and <sighs> and snapped his and smashed his cheekbone within 30 seconds. I got fined, but I thought like... <laughs> Stuff this. Teach you know, him a lesson. Yeah, it, it is what it is. In his place. Yeah. And, and that's the way. That's the way. Like back then, sort of, uh, yeah. it was. You know what I mean? And he ran yeah. off to get a knife. Is that what you said? Oh, the, Momo did. Yeah, Momo. Yeah. So there was a bit of a confrontation in one of the uh, yeah. small side games, and he literally ran to get. He goes, "I'm going to get a knife. I'm going to stab you." And literally, if you know Momo, look, Momo would flip over anything. You know, like African mentality, beautiful, Switch. lovely, but. Just like that, <laughs> he could turn. So when I saw Momo running, I'm like, man, this guy's serious. So I literally <laughs> bolted to say, listen, Momo, you, you can't stab him. Yeah. Like, literally, you can't yeah, stab him. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, like, this is just football. <laughs> you know? It's crazy. So I, I, had calm, I had to calm him down for like half an hour. I said, listen, yeah, just go home. Someone lock the kitchen door. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Mate, <laughs> and, and, and he was my neighbor. <laughs> Jeez, that's scary. <laughs> lock the door so at night. It was crazy. Yeah. But like these little stories, you know, they happen not all the time, but 
that they have to yeah. exist. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you want to go through the prize pack for Paddy today for, for joining us on the Dawson Yeah, well, so show. Golf Box, uh, they've been so nice and generous. They've given you a $250 Golf Box voucher. Oh, fantastic. So uh, you mentioned off air you love your golf. I love my golf. <laughs> so Left-hander. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> And then our major naming rights partner, Fleet Plant Hire, they're the best in the business when it comes to earth moving equipment. Now, they love their golf too. So they've provided you with uh, some balls, some tees, some socks, uh, a nice golf towel as well. Fantastic. Thank Um, you. We'll give that to you off here. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So uh, I'll take that. We really appreciate it. Just one question, one quick answer. First name that comes to mind, best player you played with? Mm. That's a good one. (laughs) Um, there's so many. Yeah, like there's so many. For I'm, I'm gonna say, what about one for each team? You know that you might have played with all right, the bigger so, clubs. So one for Hearts. Yeah, for Hearts, I'll say Stephen Presley, who's okay. the captain, just by pure leadership and what he gave to us as players. Leicester. Hmm. Uh, that's a hard one, Lester. That's Too many. A, yeah, that, that's a hard one, Lester, because we had a a, a, a lot of good players. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to leave Lester. Okay. Out. Leeds. Leeds. We were looking at the squads, and there was a lot of players yeah. that went on to I, do. I, I, there's probably two. I'll say. Uh, look, everyone's gonna say Jermaine Beckford, mm-hmm. but he was great. Don't get me wrong. But I think overall, when I when I watched it, I think Johnny Howson was... Yeah, okay. He, he was everything. He was in the midfield, you know. He didn't score as much, but he did a lot of work. You know, I had Robert Snodgrass and you know, mm. Bradley Johnson. You know, that, those players were great. Luciano Becchio. So these players were Schmeichel good. Schmeichel in goal. Casper. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, so like... <laughs> Might have got you out of jail yeah. a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of good players, but I think Johnny, yeah. he was that. He was such a young boy, but you could see the potential in him. And obviously, I think he's the captain of the yep. right now. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. What about City? Look, I'm going to have, when I, when I saw him, look, I think, I think Moisey was, oh, yeah. Moisey was good. Oh, yeah. Um, I think Moisey was good. But when I look at it, you know, Bruno was fantastic. Yeah. yeah even Harry Navillo. Yeah, he was Harry a good Harry Navillo was, on his day, was yeah. one of the best I've seen in this country because he yeah. could do everything, you know. Yeah. It's just that his mentality, you know, killed him, but he, yeah. what a player he, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was a star. He, what yeah. a player he was, you yeah. know. Yeah. Love that. Well, Paddy, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. We've we've had a ball. It's been unbelievable to chat with you. Thank you for being so honest. Thank you for sharing some stories. Um, we've loved it. We can't thank you enough, and we really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, me, Paddy. Guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.